Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Good to be here to together to express our thanks to our God for all of his blessings to us. Our service is printed out for us in our service folder, so we'll begin our Thanksgiving worship with him 609. We praise for God and redeemer.
God. Your mercies are new every morning, and you graciously provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may acknowledge your goodness, give thanks for your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience all our days. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading, which will also be the basis for today's message, is the Old Testament lesson from the book of 2 Samuel, in chapter 7. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, Sovereign Lord, and what is my family, that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, Sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, Sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, Sovereign Lord. For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, Sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing hymn 601, a hymn version of Psalm 100. seen in me, put it into practice, 
and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel and as we respond to our lesson in 605. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love is shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. We'll sit down and sing in 597. I'll thank you all of you.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Amen. At the end of the sermon, we will confess our faith in our God as we think about all the blessings and thanksgiving, primarily the blessings of our bodies, our lives. We confess that it is God the Father who has made us, continues to provide all that we need to take care of this life. He preserves us by protecting us from so many dangers. And then at the end of Luther's explanation that we will use to this first article of the Creed, he tells why God does it, and it has nothing to do with us. All this God does only because he is my good and merciful Father in heaven, and not that I have earned or deserved it. Martin Luther, in putting that into his catechism, in explaining that first article of the Creed, and believing God the Father Almighty, found things in Scripture that say this. And one of them, perhaps, is how David responded to God after God had made a wonderful promise to him. David, it says, as king of Israel, said, Who am I, Lord? What is my family, sovereign Lord, that you would be so good to? He recognized that in and of himself, he is nothing. A sinner who deserves God's condemnation and punishment, and yet God is so good to him. And in thanks, he asks, Who am I? What is my family? A thankful person asks that question What am I, God, that you have been so good to me? A little bit about situation that King David was in here. He has moved the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. He has brought the Ark of the Covenant, where those stone tablets of God's Ten Commandments were kept on, and it was a symbol of God's presence among his people. He had brought that to Jerusalem. And in the section before what we read, it says that there was peace. For so long, David, as king of Israel, had been leading his army against the enemies around them to secure their borders and bring peace and safety to his people. And that had been granted by God. And so now David has built himself, apparently, a nice palace. So he has a nice place to live. But then he looks at where that Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence among his people, was kept. And it was kept in the same kind of structure in which it had been kept 400 years before when Moses was leading the people of Israel through the wilderness to that promised land. A big curtain surrounding an area in which it was just a big tent. And this is their place for sacrifice. This tent, or tabernacle, is where that Ark of the Covenant was kept. A place where the Lord says, I will meet you, my people. And David says, well, I have a nice house, but the Lord and his ark sitting in a tent. It deserves, and he deserves better than that. So he goes to his friend, God's prophet Nathan, might have been just like David's pastor, and he says, I would like to do something for the Lord our God. I would like to build a house for the Lord. A temple. And Nathan first told him, that sounds like a good idea. You go ahead and do what your heart desires. But that night, the Lord appeared to his prophet Nathan and told him, I've been in this tent for 400 years. I don't need a house built by human hands. That's fine. But David is not the one who's going to do it. Tell him, his son will do it. And not only, you won't build a house for me, David, I will build a house for you. And he's talking not about a physical structure, but he's talking about God's family. Your son will build this. And this is how a lot of the Old Testament prophecies work. There's kind of a, a near time 
small fulfillment. But then there's the major, the main fulfillment in the coming of Jesus. His birth in Bethlehem and also then his second coming at Judgment Day. And so this little prophecy, this promise from the Lord through Nathan tells David that a son of his will build a temple, a house for the Lord there in Jerusalem. That would be Solomon, who was not yet born. But the greater fulfillment is in that descendant of David, that son, Jesus. The son of God taking on human flesh and blood as a descendant of King David's family. And he would build a house for David, a house for David to live in, a house for his family to live in, a house for you and me to live in. His church, his body of believers, and then a perfect place with him in heaven as our sin and guilt is revealed and saved. So Nathan tells King David this the next day. And David, as we're already reading, started, he went and he sat before the Lord. Maybe he went to that tabernacle, maybe in that nice palace he built, he built himself a little chapel where he could go and meditate on God's word and pray. And he prays these words that we heard. What am I, Sovereign Lord? What is my family that you have brought me this far? You've made me king. You've conquered all my enemies for me. You've given peace. You've given rest and security. And beyond that, you make a promise to me about the future, about a great descent who will build your house church. What am I? He recognizes his sinfulness before God, that he doesn't deserve anything. And, and in this section of 2 Samuel and everything prior to it, David looks like a almost sinless guy. But in a few chapters later in 2 Samuel, you'll see him fall. His lust will overtake him when he sees that beautiful woman Bathsheba and he decides he needs to have an adulterous affair with her. She's married already to one of the soldiers in his army. And after that, when God brings him to repentance, he confesses and acknowledges what he is and what's kind of behind these words. What am I? What is my family? He knows, and this is in Psalm 51, that David composed after that affair, after the repentance, after he was assured of God's forgiveness, I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. In another psalm written about the same time, Psalm 32, how blessed is the person whose guilt and rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away as I groaned all day long. That's what David knew about himself rebellious he had been toward God's commands, how disobedient and how hurtful to the other people. And when the prophet Nathan came to David after that adulterous affair, the words that he had from God were, you brought shame on my name, shame on this nation. And this David confessed, and here it's, why am I, Lord, that you continue to be so good to me and make this promise about the future? Confession of his unworthiness is the beginning of his thanks for this wonderful promise and all that God has done for him before. And then it continues at the end of our section where he kind of gives the answer to what another question would be. Who are you, God? What are you that you would do this? He said, you are great, O Lord. There is no one like you. There is no God but you. He's saying that this God is totally unlike us. He forgives. He's full of grace. He's full of love. He's full of mercy and compassion. He has pity on his creatures whom he has made, who have rebelled and cast themselves underneath his judgment. So that David could also write later on that same Psalm 32, how blessed is the person whose guilt the Lord does not charge against him, 
I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. All for the sake of that great descendant, that great son who would come and would be sinless in the place of David and in the place of every other human being who would be punished in our place for his sake. He is totally gracious. He forgives the guilt of our sin. And how David responds shows a thankful heart. Acknowledges his unworthiness, acknowledges the great mercy and grace of his God, provides all that we need for body and soul, a place in his house through that great son of David. And so David goes to the Lord with this response. There's another response that he could have made. You see, God took something away from him. Something that David expected would bring him great joy to build this magnificent temple to the glory of the Lord his God who was so good to him would have brought him great joy. And God pulled that away from him. You're not going to get to do that. So he could have gone in before the Lord and pouted. I'm a little upset with you, God, that you took that great privilege away from me. As he saw that when God took that one away, he gave him a greater joy. Your son will build this, and your greater son, a thousand years later, will build my house, and you have a place in it, David, because he's the one who's going to win for you your forgiveness and your righteousness before me. And there David becomes an example for us. The Apostle Paul wrote about so many of the accounts in the Old Testament being warnings for all of us who read them, such as the children of Israel under Moses' direction, when they would complain about the manna that God gave them to eat, to care for every day, and yet they still complained about it. Or David and Bathsheba, a warning to us about the lust in our own hearts. But also many of those accounts of these people become examples of how to respond to God's mercy as well. And in this case, David is one. Something gets taken away, gets lost, and yet he responds with thanks to God because he sees all the greater blessings that God has given. And sometimes, as perhaps the attitude in our hearts too, we lose something. Something gets taken away in our lives, and there's not thanks there to God for all the other blessings and the greater blessings. We maybe pout, we maybe get bitter with our God. But when he takes something away, never takes away that great promise he made to David, the great son of David, who would build a house for the Lord in which all his people will live. And that's why in all the challenges and struggles, when you lose things, we can still, with thanksgiving, as Paul said, make our requests to God. In that Philippians lesson, Paul maybe had some stuff to be bitter about. He had been put in prison in Rome for preaching about Christ. And he said, rejoice, I'll say it again, rejoice, the Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to everybody. And then go to God with requests, with thanksgiving. So even in our losses and our challenges and our struggles, he never takes that biggest promise away. And he still continues to provide everything that we need to serve him here in this life. And so, our thanks as thankful people starts with the question, what am I, Lord, that you would be so good to me? And it continues with the words of David, how great are you, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. There is no God but you, as we have heard by our own ears. Amen. The peace of God that goes beyond our understanding, guard our hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and confess our faith that we use Martin Luther's explanation from the Catechism explanation of the first article. I believe that God created me in all that exists, and that it gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind, and all my abilities. And I believe that God still preserves me by richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, 
property and home, spouse and children, land, cattle, and all my own, and all I need to keep my body and life. God also preserves me by defending me against all danger, guarding and protecting me from all evil. All this God does only because he is my good and merciful Father in heaven, and not because I have heard of praise him. For all this I ought to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. We'll sit down with great courage. Also in our prayers today, we include Jeanette Wicknagel, who is quite ill and is hospitalized. Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, you made all things beautiful. You have provided green forests and refreshing streams. You have arranged the orderly procession of day and night for our work and rest. Thank you for the mountains and the prairies, the roaring sea and the gentle breeze. Thank you for roofs that shelter us, for clothing that protects us, and for food and drink. Thank you for our work, for projects that are done well, and for the approval of supervisors and teachers. Thank you for all who serve at night to make our days more pleasant. Thank you for associates at work, for their encouragement and praise, and for the joys of human friendships. Thank you for our cities and our countrysides, for farms and factories, for streets and highways, and for all of life that flows so swiftly before us. Thank you for the children at play, and their boundless energy, and their shots of joy and happiness. Thank you for the morning greetings we receive, and for all the smiles that come from faces loved by you. Thank you for Christian parents, for their affection and their care. Thank you for the healing you bring when we are sick, the protection you send when we are in danger, and the comfort you offer when we are sad. Hear our prayers for Jeanette Whitnable as she is ill and hospitalized. Grant her strength and recovery, it would be your will. And lead us to be thankful as we believe that in all things you work for the good of those who love you. Thank you for those who help and encourage us in difficult times. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for his coming to us in word and sacraments, for his giving and forgiving, and for listening to our prayers. Receive our gifts and offerings as our sacrifice of praise. Lead us in thankful living today and always. Amen. We continue with him 505 for the beauty of the earth.
Good Lord, you provide for the needs of your people because your mercy endures forever. Give us each day our daily bread and keep us mindful of your gifts that we may always receive them with thanks. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll sit down and sing our closing hymn, 507. Sunday after the late service, so about 11 o'clock, um, it's decorating time. Time to take down the Thanksgiving decorations and get some early Advent and Christmas decorations up. So Christmas trees will be going up. You can use some good muscles to help with that. So guys, you've got some time. Uh, so a little heads up on that. Other than that, we'll see you Sunday. Lord's blessings. Thank you.